Thank you, Betty. Um, as you just heard, I'm actually going to do double duty this morning. Um, first, I'm going to give my director's report per usual. Then we'll pause, and I'll take any discussion you want to have about director's report. But then I'll go immediately after that um, into a, a, an important presentation related to the next round of NHGRI strategic planning. So as is our routine, let me just remind you that the entire open session of the National Advisory Council for Human Genome Research meeting is being webcast live, including my director's report. And so I certainly want to personally welcome all of you who are joining us uh, remotely in addition to those who are here in the room. Um, the open session is also being videotaped, and those recordings will be made available as part of a permanent archive on NHGRI's website, genome.gov, including the presentations themselves and the various associated documents. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why we decided to have more abbreviated minutes that you just approved, um, thinking that we don't need to type out a lot of uh, summaries about the discussion when we're now making all these uh, videotapes available for online viewing. So if people want to dig deep in instead of hearing our summary of that discussion, they can just jump on YouTube and immediately look at any session, any section of any of the open sessions of any of our council meetings. Now, related particular um, to my director's report, and particularly for those who are new to our council meetings, I want to make you aware of an electronic resource that we make each time and develop it associated with my director's report to enhance it. Um, it's analogous to a supplemental materials of a published paper, um, and you can always access uh, that resource um, at this URL uh, that's given here. Um, the slides that I'll be showing um, in my director's report are also available electronically, both as original PowerPoint file as well as a PDF. Um, when there are documents that are relevant um, or websites that are relevant to a particular slide, you'll find a document number on the bottom right-hand corner of the slide. Uh, that document number references materials that can be accessed or downloaded uh, from the website shown here. And we ensure that this web page and all the linked documents are permanently archived on genome.gov as, as a historic record of this meeting and of each of my director's reports. Now, there's going to be some other uh, presentations during the open session of this council meeting. My director's report is specifically tailored around those presentations, so I won't dig deep into the topics that are going to be covered by others. Um, immediately after my director's report, you get me again. Um, and as I mentioned, you're going to hear a presentation entitled En Route to a 2020 Vision for Genomics, the next round of NHGRI strategic planning. Um, then we'll have a lunch break. And then after lunch, uh, Michael Lauer, the NIH Deputy Director for Extramural Research, will be here to give some updates from Building One, uh, Next Generation Researchers Initiative, and Clinical Trials Reforms. Um, then uh, NHGRI's Michael Smith will present a concept clearance for novel nucleic acid sequencing technology development. Uh, two reports will then follow. Um, NHGRI's Lita Proctor will talk about the Human Microbiome Project, an NIH Common Fund project. Um, and Council Member Sharon Plon will talk about recommendations from the 2017 Emerge and Beyond workshop. Ending the open session, um, Jim Ostell, who's now the director of the National Center for Biotechnology Information, or NCBI, uh, will give a presentation entitled NCBI in a Data-Enabled data World. And that will be uh, the endpoint of our open session. So for my director's report, I'm going to now go through and cover these seven areas, uh, which have reliably provided a nice framework for covering the topics that we want to cover. And we'll start with some general NHGRI updates. Um, two weeks ago, um, I was honored uh, to travel to Bangkok, Thailand, to accept the 2017 Prince Mihito Award in the field of medicine which was given to the Human Genome Project. By way of background, the Prince Mihido Award is a, was established in 1992 to honor the late Prince Mihido, the grandfather of the present King of Thailand. Now, he modernized medical services and education systems of Thailand last century and is often referred to as the father of modern medicine and public health in Thailand. The award is given annually in two categories, uh, one in the field of medicine and one in the field of public health. The 2017 award in the field of medicine was given to the Human Genome Project. To read from the press release, the Prince Mahido Award in the field of medicine 2017 recognizes the Human Genome Project for its collaborative success that has contributed to the remarkable advancement of medicine to the enormous benefit of mankind, end of quote. The entire field of genomics, in particular all of those who worked on the Human Genome Project from 1990 to 2003, should be immensely proud to be given this prestigious award. 
I was truly honored to be asked to accept the award on behalf of the Human Genome Project. And the photo shown here is from the actual award ceremony in the Grand Palace in Bangkok, where I accepted the award from Her Royal Highness, Princess Mahi Chakra Sinidorn, Sinidorn of Thailand. Of note, the 27, uh, 2017 Prince Mahi Do Award in Public Health was given to a group of four researchers who worked on developing a vaccine for Haemophilus influenza type B. In other developments, I'm delighted to report, finally, that Carolyn Hutter has been selected as the new director of NHGRI's Division of Genome Sciences. As all of you know, um, Carolyn has been serving as acting director of this division since January 2017, but we are now finally able to officially select her and soon appoint her. Prior to her arrival at NIH, Carolyn was a senior staff scientist at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center and a lecturer at the University of Washington, where her research focused on genome-wide association studies and gene-environment interactions for cancer and other complex diseases. She joined NHGRI in 2013 as the lead for the Cancer Genome Atlas, or TCGA, after serving as program director for the National Cancer Institute's Epidemiology and Genomics Research Program. Carolyn's background in genetics and epidemiology, in conjunction with her experience in managing large research collaborations, will serve her well in leading the largest component of NHGRI's extramural research program. I am personally delighted to have finally been able to present this slide uh, to Council. After 11 years, uh, Liu Wang will actually be leaving NHGRI to take a new position as chief of the translational genomics branch at the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research. In fact, Friday will be her last day with the Institute. Now, Lou came to, to NHGRI in 2006, bringing with her genetics and microbiology biology expertise, coupled with experience in the private sector. During her entire time at NHGRI, she's been part of the genome sequencing program, administering grants in the areas of Mendelian disorders, pathogens and vectors involved in infectious diseases, comparative genomic evolution, and medical sequencing. She specifically managed the Centers for Mendelian Genomics program. She also served on a number of NIH and external committees that coordinate or oversee rare disease gene discovery, organism-specific databases, or access to publicly available genomic and phenotypic data. And we certainly wish Lou all the best in her new endeavors. NHGRI staff was invited to write a commentary in Nature Review's genetics, highlighting our role in prioritizing diversity in human genomics research. This perspective was published online in Nature Review's genetics in November and will be out in print shortly. The paper highlights the importance of diversity at all levels of human genomics research, from formulating research questions to applying knowledge to healthcare systems. In addition to sharing lessons learned from NHGRI-supported research about how diversity can accelerate discovery and translational efforts, this perspective also offers near-term recommendations for researchers, for funding agencies, and journal editors. It also includes an illustrative example of how diversity can contribute to the implementation of genomic medicine, from family history and provider awareness, to clinical sequencing and genomic variant interpretation, to returning genomic results and seeking follow-up care. To further engage the scientific community, NHGRI held a Reddit Ask Me Anything, or AMA, session in December. NHGRI staff answered questions during this session, ranging from the role of genes versus environment to challenges in recruiting diverse participants for genomics research to tips for the next generation of researchers interested in this area. NHGRI, in collaboration with the NIH Tribal Health Research Office, has developed a new resource for American Indian and Alaska Native communities to learn about key aspects of genetics and genomics research and to provide examples of current and recently completed genomic research projects funded by NHGRI. This resource was debuted at a policy development workshop held last September and hosted by the University of New Mexico Comprehensive Cancer Center, NIH, and the Navajo Nation. At this workshop, Navajo President Russell Begayu announced that the tribe is considering whether to lift their moratorium on genetics research, which has been in place since 2002. NHGRI's Genomics and Health Disparities Program and the Education and Community Involvement Branch continue to lead the Institute's engagement with American Indian and Alaska Native communities. And we look forward to increasing our collaborations with these nations. 
Moving on then to some general government and NIH updates. Starting at the top, Alex Azar was sworn in as the 24th Secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, or HHS, late last month. Mr. Azar received his BA in Government and Economics from Dartmouth University and a JD from Yale University. Early in his career, he served as a law clerk for Supreme Court Justice Scalia, and under President George W. Bush, he served as general counsel for HHS and subsequently deputy HHS secretary. Mr. Azar has also served as president of the U.S. Division of Eli Lilly and Company and was a member of the board of directors of the Biotechnology Innovation Organization. And then at the NIH level, in October, Norman Ned Sharpless was sworn in as the new director of the National Cancer Institute. Dr. Sharpless was most recently the director of the Lindenberger Comprehensive Cancer Center and the Welcome Distinguished Professor in Cancer Research at the University of North Carolina. He is a practicing oncologist, caring for patients with leukemia, and leads a research group studying the cell cycle and its role in cancer and aging. He earned his undergraduate medical degrees from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And in other appointments, Jim Astell has been appointed director of the National Center for Biotechnology Information, or NCBI, at the National Library of Medicine. Dr. Astell has actually been with NCBI since it was established by Congress in 1988. NCBI is a major component of the National Library of Medicine and runs more than 40 online databases, including GenBank and PubMed, which are accessed daily by thousands of researchers worldwide. Prior to his appointment as NCBI director, Dr. Estelle served as chief of the NCBI information engineering branch. And as I mentioned earlier, we'll be hearing a presentation from Jim later today. Anna Maria Napolis has been appointed the scientific director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, or NIMHD. Dr. Napolis joins NIMHD after serving as a professor and behavioral epidemiologist at the University of California, San Francisco since 2001. She has been at the forefront of developing methods for community-engaged translational research to improve the health of disparity populations. In terms of departures, after 15 years, uh, Roderick Pettigrew has departed as director of the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering, or NIBIB, as it's called. As founding NIBIB director, Dr. Pettigrew established and built a brand new enterprise at NIH devoted, devoted to biomedical imaging and bioengineering. In his new position, he will be the chief executive officer of a new program called NHealth that will integrate engineering into all of the Texas A&M colleges that are part of the healthcare enterprise. In addition, he will be the executive dean of a new Houston-based engineering medicine track within the initiative called NMED, which will train Texas A&M medical students to invent solutions to challenging medical problems. While a national search for a new NIBIB director is conducted, uh, Dr. Jill Hemiskirk will serve as the acting director. In terms of honors for distinguished members of the NIH community, John Schiller and Doug Lowy of the National Cancer Institute were the recipients of the 2017 Lasker DeBakey Clinical Medical Research Award. This award was given to these two researchers in recognition of their foundational discoveries that led to the development of the human papillomavirus, or HPV, vaccine. Their important research has led to the approval of three preventative HPV vaccines by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Moving on to more policy-related issues, NIH released a proposed data management update to the Access Procedures for Genomic Summary Results, or GSR, under the NIH Genomic Data Sharing Policy. Now, the proposed update would enable genomic summary results from most studies deposited and NIH-designated data repositories, such as dbGaP, to be accessible through a new rapid access tier intended to facilitate access while also reminding users of the information about the NIH expectations for responsible data use. GSR from studies designated as sensitive by their submitting institutions would remain accessible as they are currently through controlled access procedures. NIH is now considering the public comments received and hopes to announce a final decision on access to genomic summary results in the next few months. Also in the policy realm, final revisions that would have updated the common rule were issued last year and were set to go into effect on January 19th, 2018. However, an interim final rule has now been issued to delay the effective date by six months. 
to July 19, 2018. This will provide institutions with more time to comply with these revisions. Before the effective date, the institutions can begin implementing some of the provisions of the revised common rule that are not in conflict with the current common rule, such as including the new elements of informed consent in informed consent forms. Federal departments and, and agencies are also working to develop a notice of proposed rulemaking that would likely propose a further delay in implementation of a revised common rule and would be open for public comment, so stay tuned. Again, in the policy realm, the 21st Century Cures Act, passed in December of 2016, contained a provision strengthening the protections offered by Certificates of Confidentiality, or COCs, and requiring HHS to issue such certificates to all federally funded investigators conducting research that collects identifiable sensitive information. Now, certificates of confidentiality are intended to protect researchers and their organizations against having to disclose identifiable information about their research participants in legal proceedings, such as in the case of a subpoena. NIH issued a policy to implement these new statutory requirements, which have been in effect since October 1, 2017, and it covers all applicable ongoing and new research funded by NIH on or after December 13, 2016. Under the new policy, investigators funded by NIH are automatically issued certificates when their research collects identifiable sensitive information about individuals. The policy also provides additional privacy protections to research participants through a new prohibition that prevents researchers from disclosing identifiable sensitive information about their research participants, with some exceptions. Under the previous authority, the protection was voluntary on the part of the certificate holding institution. NIH has updated its Certificate of Confidentiality web pages to reflect the changes in policy and to help investigators and institutions comply, uh, to, com to have them comply with the outlined responsibilities. Moving on to budget, as you know, fiscal year 2018 began on October 1, 2017, but the federal government still does not have a budget for the year. Since October, uh, the government has been operating under a series of continuing resolutions, or CRs. And as many of you uh, know from watching the news, very early last Friday, another, albeit short, government shutdown happened. Uh, but then the House and Senate passed yet another CR, this time funding the government through March 23rd. But importantly, uh, this latest bill also reflects a bipartisan deal that provides a general top-line budgetary framework for the next two years. With the high-level budget numbers agreed to, the appropriators will now spend the next six, week, six weeks writing an omnibus spending package that should include exact numbers for NIH through the end of fiscal year 2018. This is obviously welcome news since it should end the cycle of shutdown threats and continuing resolutions, uh, at, at least for this fiscal year. Meanwhile, as March 23rd approaches, we will all be anxiously waiting to see the final fiscal year 2018 budget numbers for NIH and for NHGRI. It would certainly be nice if NIH's appropriation resembles the level already approved by the Senate Appropriations Committee. As you may recall, the Labor HHS bill, that detailed funding for NIH includes a $2 billion increase for NIH for a total funding level of $36.1 billion. Moving on then to some general uh, genomics updates. Last month, Arno Matulski passed away at the age of 94. Dr. Matulski was a prominent and highly accomplished human and medical geneticist and a founder of the field of pharmacogenomics. He was the first to describe negative interactions between drugs and enzymes produced by human genes in people, thus illustrating a role of genomic variation in the response to pharmaceuticals. He co-authored with Frederick Vogel a human genetics textbook on what was considered the textbook of human genetics for many years. His work greatly influenced all corners of human and medical genetics. Meanwhile, council member Jeff Botkin, shown here, received the 2017 George Cunningham Visionary Award in Newborn Screening, an honor given by the American Public Health Laboratory Association. The ceremony for this award actually kept um, him from attending the September council meeting in person. Uh, Dr. Botkin was honored for both his research and his leadership. His research has influenced the national dialogue and policies on newborn screening and secondary use of residual dried blood spots. He has also served on relevant committees 
as both the national and state levels to improve newborn screening. Congratulations, Jeff. And in other developments involving council members, uh, the, a new institute called the Brotman um, Beatty Institute for Precision Medicine has been launched in Seattle. The University of Washington, the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Institute Center, um, and Seattle Children's Hospital will collaborate to discover personalized treatments based on patients' genetic and molecular profiles. Jeffrey and Susan Brotman and Pam and Dan Beatty have made $50 million gift to create the institute and uh, importantly, council member uh, Jay Shanduri will direct it. So congratulations, Jay. In other honors, the American Society of Human Genetics gave awards to four members of the genomics community at its 2017 annual meeting. Kari Stephenson was given the William Allen Award, which recognizes the scientists for substantial and far-reaching scientific contributions in human genetics. Art Baudet received the Victor A. Mucusic Leadership Award, which recognizes individuals who have fostered and enriched the development of human genetics and its assimilation into the broader context of science, medicine, and health. John Mulvihill, a senior consultant in the NHGRI Division of Genomic Medicine, was presented the Mentorship Award, which recognizes ASHG members who have significant records of accomplishment as mentors. And finally, Dan MacArthur received the Early Career Award for his contributions to genetics and genomics in the first 10 years of his career as an independent investigator. Congratulations to all of them. And similarly, congratulations to Howard Chang, who is the recipient of the 2018 National, Science, National Academy of Sciences Award in Molecular Biology. The award has a rich history, including serving as a precursor to 14 Nobel Prizes. The award cites Dr. Chang's contributions to genome sciences and new technologies that were actually made possible by the NHGRI Centers of Excellence in Genomic Sciences, or SEGS, program. And the honors continue. The National Academy of Medicine recently announced the election of new members of particular relevance to the genomics community and to NHGRI, or the individuals listed here. We extend our health, heartfelt congratulations to these individuals, especially to Council Member Shanita hughes Halbert. Congratulations. Similarly, an impressive group of genetics and genomics researchers, as well as good NHGRI friends, were recently elected to be fellows of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, or AAAS, with their names listed here, and congratulations to all these individuals as well. In terms of a former council member, meanwhile, former council member Howard Jacob has left Hudson Alpha to join AbbVie, a pharmaceutical research and development company, as the vice president for genomic research. Along with some broad responsibilities, Dr. Jacob will work towards developing a rare disease program at AbbVie. Moving on to some year-end accolades, three genomics-related efforts were named runners-up for science's breakthrough of the year. They were pinpoint gene editing, a cancer drug's broad swipe, and gene therapy triumph. Uh, admittedly, it was hard to compete with the winner because uh, the winner was the merger of two neutron stars. Pretty impressive. Meanwhile, Nature's list of science events that shaped the year for 2017 honors other genomic breakthroughs, which they just grouped together and collectively called them genetics bonanza. And when, when the scientist came out with its top 10 innovations of 2017, Genomic technologies once again appeared on the list. Three genomic innovations were included, and I list them here at the bottom of the slide. Each of these three innovations involves some aspect of genome sequencing or genome editing. And in terms of genomes in the news, you guessed it. Um, there have been a number of recently generated genome sequences that were reported since the last council meeting. It includes the following, here we go, the orchid, the firefly, Wheat, the white guinea yam, gingzing, durian, the wild olive, the sea cucumber, a 40,000-year-old man from Tian Cave in China, the placid killer bees from Puerto Rico, a reindeer, a wheat progenitor, uh, not one but two hot peppers, the Tasmanian tiger, of course, that famous beluga whale, an ancient Alaskan, the Sudi Mangabe, the dingo, uh, much in the news, cannabis, uh, Mexican axolotl, and a planarium flatworm. 
So that's the list since the last council meeting. Continues to be impressive. Moving on then to the NHGRI extramural program. And we will start with the genome sequencing program, or GSP. And this is composed of a coordinating center, four analysis centers, four centers for common disease genomics, and four centers for Mendelian genomics, as shown on this uh, map of the United States. The GSP received budgetary support also not only from NHGRI, of course, but also from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, the National Institute on Aging, the National Eye Institute, and the Simons Foundation. Now, digging a little deeper, the Centers for Common Disease Genomics are using large-scale genome sequencing to discover genomic variants underlying common diseases, to learn about disease architectures and study designs, and to identify rare risk and protective genomic variants. The Genome Sequencing Program Analysis Centers undertake novel, investigator-initiated computational analyses of the data produced by the data generating centers. They also intend to develop improved and novel analysis methods and study designs across the entire program. The Centers for Common Disease Genomics have sequenced almost 51,000 whole genomes and 38,000 whole exomes. The first freeze of this data, which includes 20,000 whole genome sequences, was delivered to the program's consortium in November of last year. The genome sequencing program is collaborating with NHLBI's Transomics for Precision Medicine, or TOPMED program, to perform joint data calls with the eventual goal of large-scale joint data analysis. And as a follow-up to the program's partnership to TopMed, representatives from each program convened for a day-and-a-half joint analysis workshop at Vanderbilt uh, last month. Then meanwhile, the Centers for Mendelian Genomics program is halfway through its current funding cycle. These centers aim to use genome sequencing and analysis to discover the genomic basis underlying as many Mendelian diseases as possible. And in doing so, they will accelerate gene discovery by disseminating methods and results within the consortium and the broader research community. Now, these centers have implicated over 2,600 disease genes using conservative and suggestive criteria. Many of the suggestive genes potentially represent novel discoveries. The Centers for Mendelian Genomics post on their website a public list of studied phenotypes and genes with links to OMIM and PubMed IDs. These centers were associated with 65 presentations at the 2017 American Society of Human Genetics meeting. And to date, there are over 400 publications that involve co-authorships with center investigators and researchers. These publications detail disease gene discoveries, method and tool development, disease diagnoses, group collaborations, and future perspectives. The centers regularly contribute data to Match Major Exchange and the Monarch Initiative. And data from these platforms are being used as part of driver projects for the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, or GA4GH, which aims to drive the uptake of standards and frameworks for genomic data sharing within research and healthcare communities. Moving on then to NHGRI's technology development program, this program continues to move forward, paving the way to develop new and improve existing technologies to enable genomic discoveries and facilitate adoption of genomics in medicine. An advanced genomic technology development meeting was held again this year. Um, uh, will be held again this year in May at Northeastern University. A novel nucleic acid sequencing and genomic technology grantees from the program will meet over several days to facilitate communication, collaborations, interactions. But meanwhile, an adjacent public meeting will be held on June 1st that will allow the broader community to participate and interact uh, with grantees and NHGRI staff. The goals of the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, or ENCODE project, is to create catalogs of all functional elements in the human and mouse genomes, and to make those catalogs available as a resource to the biomedical research community. The ENCODE consortium held its annual meeting last week, actually, in Palo Alto, California. This was the first time that the ENCODE 4 mapping, computational analysis, data analysis, data coordination, and new functional characterization centers all came together. The meeting served as a platform for the consortium to present its accomplishments from the past year, to discuss ongoing research, and to lay out goals for the consortium moving forward. ENCODE data continues to be heavily used by the research community, as evident by the approximate 2,000 publications to date from researchers outside of the consortium that use ENCODE data and associated resources. Of, and of these, more than 500 focused on human diseases, attesting to the translational value of the ENCODE resource. 
And to show you an example of this, shown here is how ENCODE data are being used to help direct gene therapy targets. Gene therapy clinical trials for beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease are now on the horizon, including efforts to target an erythroid enhancer identified in part using ENCODE data. This enhancer selectively regulates the expression of the BCL11A, a gene encoding a transcription factor that is responsible for down-regulating the expression of fetal hemoglobin in erythroid cells. It is hoped that by disrupting the expression of BCL11, BCL11A, fetal hemoglobin expression will not be downregulated. Individuals who are genetically predisposed to having elevated levels of fetal hemoglobin as adults have less severe forms of beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease. In October of 2017, Sangoma Therapeutics and BioVeritav announced FDA's acceptance of an investigational new drug, or IND, application for a gene therapy method designed to delete the erythroid enhancer to treat beta thalassemia, with the plan to then beginning enrolling patients this year. Similarly, in December of 2017, CRISPR Therapeutics, in collaboration with Vertex Pharmaceuticals, announced submission of a clinical trial application for genome editing that targets the BCL11A erythroid enhancer to treat beta thalassemia. Now, these approaches, which are the first to target non-coding regulatory region, um, represent one of the se of several emerging avenues of pursuit for gene therapy to treat these hemoglobinopathies. The Centers of Excellence in Genomic Science, or SEGS, program supports interdisciplinary research teams to develop highly innovative approaches in genomics research. We expect to announce a new SEGS award in the spring of 2018. As an example of the type of collaborative discussions that can come out of this program, Several of the SEGS PIs actually met to discuss the needs in the area of epigenomics and precision health. From that meeting, these PIs published their recommendations about standard reagents, analysis pipelines, and naming of functional elements, and about studying how well accessible tissues, such as blood and saliva, can provide information about inaccessible tissues. These are important issues that apply to all functional data types. The NHGRI EBI Genome-Wide Association Studies, or GWAS Catalog, is an online resource providing curated results from GWAS papers and user-provided summary statistics. Last September, a commentary by Popjoy and Fullerton based on GWAS Catalog data observed a marked bias towards European ancestry populations in published GWAS findings. In a more recent and detailed analysis in press at Genome Biology, the GWAS catalog team expanded upon this initial observation. A bias towards European ancestry participants remains, with 78% of participants of European ancestry, compared to about 22% across different non-European ancestry categories. However, non-European populations contribute disproportionately at 46% more associations than expected given the distribution of participants. For example, African ancestry contributes 2.4% of participants, but 7% of the associations. Similarly, Hispanic Latin American ancestry contributes 1.3% of participants, but 4% of the associations. This underscores the scientific value of including diverse ancestry participants in GWAS, which will likely continue to identify new associations. The Phoenix Toolkit is a growing online resource of standard measures for capturing data on common diseases, phenotypic traits, and environmental exposures. It continues to add more features, including new translations of existing measures. Dr. Jim Zhang now, has now published Chinese translations of 294 protocols from 21 Phoenix research domains. These translations are now freely available on the Phoenix Toolkit website. Shown here is a translation of measure uh, number 010600 for recording a participant's self-reported race. In addition to the question and response categories, background information about the protocol has also been translated, including the actual definition and purpose of the selected Phoenix measure. The Electronic Medical Records and Genomics, or EMERGE network, conducts genomic discovery and clinical implementation research by leveraging data from large biorepositories linked to electronic medical and health records. 
In October, NHGRI hosted a program review workshop entitled Emerging Beyond the Future of EHR and Genomics Workshop. As Emerge Phase 3 will end in June 2019, we thought that it was important to have this workshop. Um, the gathering was attended by external experts from key areas of genomic medicine, including some NHGRI council members who also served as planning group members, presenters, discussants, and also moderators. The workshop reviewed the current goals and accomplishments of Emerge, as well as suggested future directions for a possible continuation of Emerge. There were several major recommendations coming out of the meeting. These included developing a better phenotyping methods and technologies, and also incorporation of machine learning methods, building pipelines to automatically interpret and reinterpret genomic variants and to integrate genomic data into EMRs, promoting shareable electronic clinical decision support by enhancing existing knowledge repositories, and generating evidence for genomic medicine through communicating directly to patients through family sharing, health literacy, and automated technology. And you're going to hear more details about this workshop later in the open session in a presentation given by Council Member Sharon Kwan. In addition, last month, the Emerge Investigators published an article entitled Ethical Considerations Related to Return of Results from Genomic Medicine Projects, the Emerge Network Phase 3 Experience. Now, this article examined the Institutional Review Board, or IRB, processes at nine academic institutions for proposed electronic health record-based genomic medicine studies and identified common questions and concerns related to the studies that involve the return of results from genome sequencing. The most common concerns raised by various IRBs were related to participants understanding the study results, and the best way to mitigate these concerns is to provide robust participant support, such as establishing mechanisms to answer questions regarding any portion of the research during consent and providing easily understandable interpretations of testing results. It was also found that communicating with IRB staff prior to and during protocol review appeared to be beneficial for clarifying, clarifying study considerations and may reduce the time for approval. The information published in this article can now help investigators more effectively engage with IRBs for genomic medicine implementation research. Moving on, the Clinical Genome Resource, or ClinGen, defines and disseminates the clinical relevance of genomic variants for use in precision medicine and research. We are pleased to announce that in fall of 2017, ClinGen was renewed for an additional four years. Three multi-PI teams listed here will continue to work to accelerate curation activities and expand to new disease areas, including pediatric neurology, hematology, and skin diseases. Furthermore, uh, they will develop quantitative approaches um, to enhance the use of ACMG sequence variant interpretation guidelines among many new activities aimed at improving their suite of tools to facilitate gene and variant curation. Additionally, with co-funding from the NHGRI LC Research Program, um, ClinGen will continue to work to define consent and disclosure recommendations for gene disease pairs. These recommendations will help non-geneticist clinicians identify when to refer patients to genetic counselors or to medical geneticists. We're also pleased to announce new collaborations with the American Society of Hematology and with the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. Both of these organizations have provided funding to assemble expert ClinGen curation panels in their respective disease areas. The American Society of Hematology panels will focus on myeloid malignancies and genetic platelet disorders, while the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development panels will target brain malformations, mitochondrial disorders, and maturity onset diabetes of the young. Each of these expert panels will use ClinGen tools and curation frameworks to evaluate the clinical relevance of genes and variants, and then share their results through ClinGen and ClinVar. The Clinical Sequencing Evidence Generating Research, or CSER, program aims to generate evidence related to the clinical utility of genome sequencing, with a major emphasis on recruiting ancestrally diverse and medically underserved populations. Work from phase one of CSER was prominently featured at the American Society of Human Genetics, or ASHG, meeting this past October. In total, there were 14 CSER-related posters and presentations, including a session on the psychological and health behavioral research outcomes of translational genomics, featuring three CSER investigators. The second phase of CSER held its kickoff meeting in September 2017, and more recently, a second meeting in January of 2018, 
with topics ranging from harmonization of Caesar-wide measures to stakeholder engagement. Caesar also heard from, uh, from the guest speaker, Dara richardson Heron, the chief engagement officer of the All of Us Research Program. The CSER investigators have now established six working groups to collaborate across multiple program areas, but the names of those working groups uh, provided here. The Newborn Sequencing in Genomic Medicine and Public Health, or NSIT, program explores in a limited but deliberative manner the implications, challenges, and opportunities associated with the possible use of genomic sequence information for the care of newborns. Recently, the work of the Kingsmore Group was featured in Time Magazine. The article, entitled Genetic Testing is Providing New Hope for Babies Born with Mysterious Ailments, describes how the INSIGHT study at Rady Children's Hospital for Genomic Medicine is using genome sequencing to provide diagnosis and suggest changes in treatments for critically ill infants in the neonatal intensive care unit. For Sabatinia, shown here, Genome sequencing led to a change in the drug used for treatment, reducing the occurrence of her seizures. The NHGRI Computational Genomics and Data Science Program supports research and development of data science methods, resources, and tools that facilitate the use of genomic data for biomedical research. The program supports widely used genomic informatics platforms and data resources. Now, the Alliance of Genomic Resources, or AGR, is a consortium of six model organism databases and the Gene Ontology Consortium, and was established in September 2016 with supplemental funds from NHGRI and the NIH Common Fund through September of 2019. NHGRI will host a one-day meeting of the AGR and the model organism databases, or MODs, in spring of 2018. The goals of the upcoming meeting include addressing the progress of the AGR and discussing future directions and organization of the AGR and its MOD members. An external scientific panel was established by NHGRI specifically for this meeting and consists of Council Member Mark Johnston, as well as the individuals listed here. And in addition to the key external scientific panel, the meeting will also be attended by AGRPIs and key personnel, as well as NHGRI and other NIH staff. The IDASH Genomic Privacy Challenge was held in October 2017 in coordination with the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, or GA4GH, plenary meeting, where data sharing and analysis while preserving privacy was also a major topic. Now in its fourth year, the IDASH Genomic Privacy Challenge brings together leaders in biomedical informatics, computer science, and cryptography to test cutting-edge solutions for working with and sharing sensitive data while preserving privacy. This year, the challenge tasks included deduplicating um, patient identifiers across sites, secure GWAS, and privacy-preserving machine learning with genotype and phenotype data to predict disease. Industry partners, such as Microsoft Research and Intel, are leading efforts to advance the underlying privacy technologies that are used in the challenge, such as homomorphic encryption and software guard extension chips. The results from last year's competition were published in Genomic Medicine in a paper by Wang et al. NHGRI provides $14 million in small business grants annually. Our current Small Business Innovation Research, or SBIR, and Small Business Technology Transfer, or STTR, portfolio include a 24 Phase I Proof of Principle and 14 Phase II Pre-Commercialization Awards in 2017. New Phase II awards are supporting work on high C-based phasing of human genome sequences at Arama Genomics, a single cell genomics at Mission Bio, gene expression analysis at BioSpider Technologies, and adaptive PCR instrumentation at BioVentures. These small business grants are drawn from an increasingly strong pool of applications. Moving on then to the NIH Common Fund and trans-NIH efforts. We'll start with uh, the Human Microbiome Project. As a reminder, in, 20, in 2007, the NIH Common Fund initiated a 10-year, $215 million initiative called the Human Microbiome Project, or HMP. This project was conceived of as a community resource effort to develop research resources for the emerging field of microbiome research. The HMP developed and provided rapid access to a suite of resources, including multi-omic reference data sets, computational tools, and analytical pipelines for analyzing and interpreting microbiome data. 
and clinical and institutional review board protocols for sampling microbiomes and for conducting microbiome research with human cohorts. As this program is coming to an end, uh, Lita Proctor of NHGRI, um, who was the program director who has ably, ably managed this program, will be making a presentation about the program's goals and accomplishments, and that'll happen later this afternoon. The Knockout Mouse Phenotyping Project, or COMP2, will create and phenotype 3,000 mouse strains um, of knocked out mice using CRISPR technology between 2016 and 2020. The project is on track to meet its spring 2018 goals. This program is part of the larger International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium, or IMPC. Last October at the ASHG meeting, NIH staff convened a joint meeting between investigators involved in the COMP2 program and the Centers for Mendelian Genomics. The purpose of the meeting was to build a partnership to improve gene discovery and to enable functional characterization of new Mendelian disease genes. Following the successful meeting, a COMP CMG working group was established to organize further collaborative efforts. Also in October, the IMPC published a paper in Nature Communications demonstrating a large unexplored genetic landscape involved in auditory function. By phenotyping 3,006 knockout strains for auditory function, investigators identified 52 genes not previously associated with hearing loss. Then in January, the IMPC published another paper in Nature Communications describing an analysis of metabolic phenotype data from 2016 knockout mice strains. That study identified 23 genes with strong new metabolic phenotypes that also have links to human metabolic disorders. The resources provided by the COMP2 IMPC program have strong community uptake as the number of publications using COMP2 resources has increased to greater than 1,400 as of last month. As an example, the recent Nature Genetics article identified mutations in the gene cell in BP1 that were present in patients with extraoral halitosis. The researchers used the comp cell in BP1 knockout mice to that were created to show that the biochemical characteristics in mice were similar to those in humans. Uh, this genetic link to bad breath got several mentions in the popular press including a feature in the self-proclaimed America's finest news source, uh, The Onion. The Genotype Tissue Expression, or GTEx project, aims to create a public atlas of human gene expression and its regulation across multiple tissue types and to aid in the functional interpretation of genetic associations with disease. Several manuscripts have been published in high-profile journals using, using the version 6, or in other words, the midway data set. Nature published and summarized the manuscripts um, um, from October of 2017. Uh, this collection um, features more than 10 papers, including news and commentary, research articles, and methods publications. And then several methods papers were also published in the November issue of Genome Research and Nature highlighting ways to predict the causal tissues for complex traits and diseases and how to predict causal variants affecting expression using whole genome sequence data and RNA-seq data from multiple human tissues. The marker paper for enhancing GTEx or eGTEx project was also published, which describes the efforts in bridging the gap between genotype, gene expression, and disease. Other recent papers published in Nature include the dynamic landscape and regulation of RNA editing in mammals, a comprehensive analysis of the genetic effects on gene expression, the impact of rare and common and structural variants on gene expression, and the landscape of X chromosome inactivation across multiple human tissues. Moving on then to H3Africa, the central goal of the Human Heredity and Health in Africa, or H3Africa Consortium, is to develop a sustainable and collaborative African genetics and genomics research enterprise. This past November, the 10th African Society of Human Genetics meeting was held in Egypt in partnership with H3Africa and the Egyptian National Society of Human Genetics. The presenters included both current and former H3Africa investigators. Additionally, we are pleased to announce that the H3Africa Consortium has reached 163 total publications as of December of 2017. And H3Africa will host the 11th consortium meeting in Uganda this coming March. 
This will be the first consortium meeting for stage two of the program, and we're looking forward to welcoming both new and returning grantees into the next five years of the H3 Africa program. Now, for stage two of H3 Africa, new and renewing awards were made in fall of 2017, augmenting the NIH Common Fund. 14 institutes and centers provided additional funds for awards given to institutions in 22 African countries. The stage two NIH awards include a coordinating center to provide administrative support, a bioinformatics network, and four bioinformatics training programs that will implement an informatics infrastructure across the H3 Africa consortium seven collaborative centers and eight research projects that will explore the link between genetics and disease, such as for sickle cell, glaucoma, HIV, and others, an LC collaborative center that will build an evidence base to inform the development of policies related to return of individual genomic research results, and one new LC project in addition to two ongoing LC projects that will investigate other ethical issues relevant to genomics in Africa. The NIH Common Fund will continue to support three biorepositories, um, which are not listed on this slide. These are located in Nigeria, South Africa, and Uganda, and will collect, process, and store, and distribute H3 Africa biospecimens on a regional and international scale. Also, additional awards for H3 Africa were just made last week by our funding partners for this program, the Alliance for Accelerating Excellence in Science in Africa and the Wellcome Trust. The NIH Common Fund's Undiagnosed Diseases Network, or UDN, aims to improve the level of diagnosis and care for patients with undiagnosed diseases, facilitate research into the etiology of these diseases, and create an integrated and collaborative research community to identify and share improved options for optimal patient management. To date, the UDN has received over 1,900 applications, accepted 824 participants for evaluation at the seven UDN clinical sites across the country. Working together as a network, uh, these sites have made 167 diagnoses. To apply to the network, access the UDN gateway by clicking on the Apply button, which appears on all the UDN one pages. You can also find real-time research updates by following the network on social media as UDN Connect. Something that may be a little new to council members, the Human Biomolecular Atlas Program, or HubMap, is a new NIH Common Fund program starting this year. Its vision is to catalyze development of an open global framework for comprehensively mapping the human body at a cellular resolution. And its premise is that better insights into the principles governing organization function relationships will potentially lead to better understanding the significance of inter-individual variability changes across the, across the lifespan, tissue engineering, and the emergence of disease at the biomolecular level. Two requests for applications, or RFAs, have been released for this program, the Transformative Technology RFA and the Tissue Mapping Center's RFA. Applications are due March 2nd. An announcement should come out soon for the HubMap Integration, Visualization, and Engagement, or HIVE, which will manage data generated by the consortium, coordinate consortium activities, develop novel tools, and build an atlas of tissue maps. There is yet another new Common Fund program being launched soon on the topic of somatic cell genome editing, which aims to develop quality tools to, to perform effective and safe genome editing in human patients. The program elements will include improved delivery systems, novel genome editors, and in vitro and in vivo assay platforms for testing safety, safety and efficacy. The information and materials will constitute a genome editing toolkit that will be distributed through a dissemination center. The funding announcements for this program uh, were published in January of 2018. Also coming new on the horizon, if you will, the NIH Data Commons is a cloud-based platform for storing, sharing, accessing, and computing on FAIR, or in other words, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable biomedical research data. The pilot phase for the NIH Data Commons started at the end of September 2017. Ten awards were made to support the establishment of an NIH Data Commons pilot phase consortium. The NIH Data Commons will initially be populated with data sets from the Common Fund Genotype Tissue Expression, or GTEx program, the NHLBI Funded Transomics for Precision Medicine, or TopMed program, and the NHGRI Funded Alliance for Genomic Research, or AGR. 
The kickoff meeting of the consortium's pilot phase took place this past December, after which awardees work collaboratively to build a project plan for the first stage of the pilot phase, which is expected to start this month. As part of the pilot phase, a cloud marketplace will be established to facilitate the procurement of cloud resources by NIH institutes and centers. The All of Us research program aims to generate data from one million or more people living in the United States to accelerate research and improve health by taking into account individual differences in lifestyle, environment, and biology. Researchers will uncover paths towards delivering precision medicine. All of Us has undertaken a number of activities to prepare for a national launch, including conducting expanded beta testing of consents, surveys, physical measurements, and biospecimen collection. Over 1,500 participants have been enrolled in the program to date. Funding is now being provided to 14 additional national community partners to help raise awareness of the program and to inform the best ways to engage and retain diverse communities. And All of Us now is partnering with the National Library of Medicine to support engagement efforts by public libraries across the United States. All of Us is also reaching out to researchers, community organizations, and citizen scientists for input on research questions that could uniquely be addressed by the program. The information will help identify how to better support research across a range of health topics. And for those interested in providing such input, uh, the deadline for this effort was recently extended to February 23rd. Of particular interest to this council, the Genomics Working Group of the All of Us Research Advisory Panel recently released a report on considerations towards a comprehensive genomic strategy for the program. As I mentioned to you in September, the working group was co-chaired by Debbie Nickerson and former council member Lon Carden. I was a member of this group, along with current council members Jason Dury and Wendy Chung. The report details considerations about the relative benefits of genome-wide genotyping, exome sequencing, and whole genome sequencing for the program. The working group suggested a phased approach, starting with a pilot study of approximately 50,000 participants, to assess the process and methods in preparations for a genomics plan that can be scaled to at least a million participants. The All of Us staff and awardees are assimilating this input while considering additional aspects, such as return of genomic information and genetic counseling needs. The program expects to outline a comprehensive genomics plan before its national launch in the spring of 2018. And that then wraps up Common Fund Trans NIH. So let me move on to NHGRI's Division of Policy, Communications, and Education. And at the 2017 American Society of Human Genetics meeting, NHGRI participated in the first annual policy luncheon. The topic of this luncheon was to learn about the Food and Drug Administration's, or FDA's, Investigational Device Exemption, or IDE, regulation. The IDE regulation requires additional oversight for some clinical genomic studies that are considered to pose a, quote, significant risk to participants. Since many in the genomics community have not yet encountered the IDE process, NHGRI and several of our grantees have been working with the FDA to clarify aspects of this regulation in the genomics research context. Now, at this luncheon, our policy branch chief, Christina Capitzi, joined a panel that included FDA's Kate Donegan, who, by the way, happens to be a former ASHG NHGRI policy fellow, and Jonathan Berg, who's an NHGRI grantee, to explain when the IDE regulation applies and what steps are necessary to comply. The luncheon sold out, and attendees asked questions about how aspects of a study, such as return of results and use of biobanked samples, could affect the applicability of the IDE. In a summary of the luncheon, the associated slides and additional resources can be found on ASHG's website or on genome.gov. At the May 2017 um, council meeting, I described outcomes of a Genomic Literacy, Education, and Engagement Initiative, or GLEE, strategic visioning meeting, which was held last March by NHGRI and the Foundation for the NIH. Since that meeting, the Education and Community Involvement Branch and the Genomic Healthcare Branch have continued working with the K-16, uh, the Community and Public, and the Healthcare Provider Working Groups. They've also engaged new partners at various national meetings throughout 2017. Last June, we hosted a session at the NIH SciEd Conference convening education researchers, teachers, and resource developers to develop the design of a K-16 educational framework for genomic literacy. 
at the October American Society of Human Genetics meeting, NHGRI hosted a pre-meeting session with 30 participants from the original strategic vision meeting to discuss the outcomes of that meeting, the current activities, and the future plans for each of the three target audience groups. And then finally, in November, we work with the National Association of Biology Teachers, or NABT, to host a session on evaluating and promoting genomics education resources for teachers. 15 educators from high schools and two- and four-year colleges, as well as other education organizations, developed an evaluation tool for resources that will be promoted through the NABT website and communications channels. And then meanwhile, as you all know, April 25th is National DNA Day, an annual time when we and many of our stakeholders come together to encourage students and teachers and the public to learn about genetics and genomics. The day commemorates the completion of the Human Genome Project in April 2003 and the reporting of DNA's double helical structure in 1953. To commemorate the 15th anniversary of DNA Day and inspired by the energy and creativity of the 2017 Glee Strategic Visioning Meeting, NHGRI and its partners will launch a public awareness campaign that we are calling the 15 for 15 celebration. This effort will be centered around 15 core topics that illustrate the advances made in genomics since the end of the Human Genome Project and the importance of genomics in people's lives. The messages associated with each topic and the associated supporting content are being shaped by the three target audiences identified through the Glee meeting, K through 16 teachers and students, communities and the general public, and healthcare professionals. The campaign will be leveraged through three major vehicles. On each of the 15 days leading up to DNA Day, we will be sharing one of the 15 topics via NHGRI social and digital media outlets. We will also be engaging partners and asking them to host community events and to participate in the social media campaign, and we will be hosting public programs. We invite you all to participate in the 15 for 15 celebration as well as DNA Day. And please visit NHGRI's DNA Day website for more information about um, this new celebration. And then meanwhile, the Genome Unlocking Life's Code exhibition returned to the United States following a brief run in Canada is now um, on the Rochester phase of its tour. Specifically, the exhibition opened last month in Rochester, New York at the Rochester Museum and Science Center. And then later this year, it moves on to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, please continue to check the exhibition's website and follow it on social media for the most up-to-date program information. And then for just over a year, NHGRI staff from our education and community involvement branch have been partnering with two tribal college faculty members who attended our annual NHGRI short course in 2016 and a new initiative called the Tribal Colleges Consortium on Genomics Training, or TCCGC. The focus of TCCGC is to increase coordination between tribal colleges, research universities, and federal agencies with regard to genomics education, to inform agencies and universities about the education and research needs of tribal nations, and to increase recruitment and preparation of tribal college students interested in genomics. Then in November, TCCGC held a pre-conference workshop at the First Americans Land Grant Consortium meeting. The, morning, the meeting, which was considered to be the launch of the initiative, brought together about 50 interested tribal college faculty, staff, and leaders to discuss the major challenges to advancing genomics education at tribal colleges and how collaboration among tribal colleges, research institutions, federal agencies, and other organizations could advance genomics education. The meeting generated considerable interest in defining short and long-term outcomes, and plans for a further rollout of TCCGC are now underway. The genomic healthcare branch has added a new case study on familial hypercholesterolemia to the 16 existing simulated patient case studies found on the Global Genetics and Genomics Community Education website, or G3C. G3C users can select questions typically asked by a provider during a patient exam and then view videotaped answers from actors. Users are able to compile and analyze patient responses and complete supplemental learning activities. After completion, the user receives a summary of their performance on the, on the case. Faculty supplemental information and classroom discussion recommendations are included, as well as published resources for future study. A videotaped expert commentary provides answers to a series of questions by a recognized expert in the field, along with recommended next steps. Dr. Um, Robert Shamburk of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute provided the commentary 
for this latest case study, and I encourage you to take a look at this resource and share it with your colleagues in provider disciplines. And then, of course, every year around Thanksgiving, NHGRI promotes National Family Health History Day. Last year's efforts included distribution of our social media toolkit, digital signage throughout the NIH campus, and social media pushes via Facebook, Twitter, and a thunderclap in collaboration with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Over 3 million people were reached through these social media efforts. In advance of National Family Health History Day, My Family Health Portrait, which is a free tool for inputting family health information supported by NHGRI's Genomic Healthcare Branch, was updated to include revised disease risk calculator descriptions, a risk and condition table, and guides for use in need of additional support. You can view these changes at the My Family Health Portrait website. And then, in a related way, the Inner Society Coordinating Committee for Practitioner Education, or ISCC, aims to improve practitioner genomic literacy and to enhance the practice of genomic medicine through the sharing of educational approaches and joint identification of educational needs. A little over a week ago, the seventh ISCC in-person meeting was held at NIH. The goals of the meeting were to facilitate discussions regarding new projects and important topics in genomics education and to share updates on current projects. In addition, Dr. Han Hannah Valentine, who's the first NIH Chief Officer for Scientific Workforce Diversity, gave a presentation about approaches to and positive impacts of increasing diversity among genomic medicine practitioners. She also discussed unconscious bias among educators and practitioners and how it relates to using genomics in clinical care. And finally, let me just give you a few updates about the Institute's intramural research program. Les Biesecker, a senior investigator in chief of the medical genomics and metabolic genetics branch in the NHGRI intramural research program, received the SS Agarwal Oration Honor at the fourth National Conference of the Society for Indian Academy of Medical Genetics and the Indo-US Symposium on Human Genetic Disorders of Prenatal and Postnatal Growth. The SS Agarwal Oration was started by the Society for the Indian Academy of Medical Genetics in memory of the late Dr. SS Agarwal, who was one of the pioneers of medical genetics in India. Dr. Biesecker presented a talk entitled Towards Predictive Genomic Medicine. And then meanwhile, another one of our chiefs, Max Munka, who's Senior Investigator and Chief of the Medical Genetics Branch in the NHR Intramural Program, is the new Editor-in-Chief of uh, the journal American Journal of, of Medical Genetics. And then just a few summaries uh, that, uh, to once again illustrate that the Intramural Program has been quite productive since the last Council meeting. Just three illustrative examples. Philip Shaw and his collaborators published a study on why some people grow out of childhood attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or ADHD, while others continue to have symptoms into adulthood. They discovered that adults with ADHD pers persisting from childhood partly lose the usual balance of connections between brain networks that control action and those that control daydreaming or introspection. Bill Pavin and Stacey Loftus were part of an international team of genomics researchers who identified regions in the human genome that are associated with skin color variation in some African populations. The findings open new avenues for research on skin diseases and cancer in all populations. And Paul Kreska and collaborators used facial analysis software to diagnose Noonan syndrome in Africans, Asians, and Latin Americans and updated their atlas of human malformation syndromes in diverse populations. And so we've Reach the end, but of course, before ending, I'd just like to, as always, put in a plug for anyone interested in receiving my monthly email update called the Genomics Landscape. You can simply go to list.nih.gov and then search for NHGRI Landscape if you're interested in one extra email a month. And of course, a personal thanks to the 50 to 60 NHGRI staff who contributed slides and other materials for this director's report. Obviously, I couldn't dare do this alone. Collective effort of everyone involved is absolutely needed each time I put one of these things together, including our communications group for getting um, the electronic resource and the web archive, video archive all set up and eventually distributed. And a special thanks to the usual ringleader uh, for preparing my director's report. It all goes through Chris. Um, uh, Chris Wetterstrand reports that she did not do anything interesting since her last council meeting, and so that's why she just used her usual staff picture. Uh, so I think that was a hint to some of us that we need to get her out more or something. So with that, I will uh, conclude uh, my director's report. 
and uh, take any general questions you have at this time. And please ask just so I can catch my breath. That was pressure. Okay. Make me work. Eric, I, I can ask a quick question. Do you want to say anything more about the work with the FDA and the investigational device and how that might impact grantees? So I would ask someone in the back of the room who's closer to the regular interactions with the FDA to come to a microphone. Is that going to be Christina? So looks like it's going to be Christina Capitzi who runs our policy branch. The repeat the question? Yes, please. Go ahead, Sharon. Um, with regard to the workshop held for the, with the FDA about investigational uh, devices, how do you see that impacting NHGRI grantees? Um, so I think, I don't think there's a one-to-one -one correlation between the workshop. I think from the workshop, we helped um, make our resources regarding the IDEs more robust. We heard some more information from the FDA about the actual process. We had some interesting questions going forth, forward. So we have some resources available online to help guide grantees through the process with all the information that we've, we've gained. Okay, any other questions? Eric. It's not so much a question, but a compliment to the field. You know, you mentioned the relationship between the CMGs and COMP, and I recently saw a presentation from Jen Posey, which was outstanding, and it, it just shows the great, I'll, I'll say the word triangle or three-legged stool between discovery in the GSP program, COMP, bringing, COMP and COMP2 bringing in functionality, and what she showed is many of the new diagnostics in private labs are actually using genes and variants that are just only recently described or discovered. So having that three-legged stool of, you know, sort of discovery, functionality, and translation to actually see that all put together is rewarding and is a compliment really to the field. So I, I agree with that, and, I, and it's one of several examples we could give. And I, what I would say, and you can see from what we described here, we are you know, constantly looking for opportunities to connect. But I would also say that sometimes we may be too close to it. So we appreciate when advisors or grantees or anybody sort of brings to our attention, you know, maybe ways to try to make programs or investigators interact because you may have a perspective or a vantage point that we may miss because I think we want to have as many of these as possible.